uh, nature deficit disorder is not a known medical diagnosis. Maybe it should be, but it's not yet. Uh, what it is, though, is it's a term that uh, I introduced in Last Child in the Woods uh, that helps us talk about, have a conversation about this disconnect from the natural world that we've been seeing going on for several decades now. Uh, never before in human history or prehistory have children spent so little time in the natural world, and that's where they used to spend most of their developing years. Uh, now, instead, we're spending more and more time uh, in front of computers and, and doing anything but going outdoors and experiencing nature. That has to have huge implications for health, for human uh, physical health, for psychological health, for the ability to learn and create, the ability to, uh, I think, feel fully alive. Second question is, how much time should we spend outdoors, ideally? I get asked often by parents, uh, how much vitamin N, uh, vitamin N for, N for nature, how much vitamin N do uh, uh, kids need? Uh, and uh, there are studies, people are trying to answer that, uh, studies in uh, the University of Essex in England of, uh, uh, of uh, how much time it takes for some kind of positive benefit, particularly psychological, if you walk through, you know, trees in an urban park. And they've determined, this one study has said five minutes will give you some kind of benefit from being outdoors. Um, uh, I, I try not to uh, put a number to that because there are so many variables. Uh, uh, everybody's different. Every setting is different. Uh, and uh, so what I tend to tell parents is uh, when it comes to how much time they should encourage their kids to spend in nature. Some is better than none, and more is better than some. Uh, how is this alienation from nature affecting us, and what about our children? What are the symptoms of this disorder? Well, the, the bad news is that we now have this body of evidence showing how fast this disconnection between children, and therefore adults later, because the children tend to grow up, how fast this is occurring. But the good news is that finally the people who study uh, child development uh, uh, are looking at the impact of the natural world. That's been pretty much ignored until the last 15 years by the academics. But now what they're finding is just a little bit of contact with nature. The symptoms of attention deficit disorder, for example, get much better with just a little bit of contact with nature. A walk through trees in an urban park will have an Im impact on kids as young as five years old in terms of uh, their ability to control themselves, their ability to, uh, our ability to reduce their symptoms of attention deficit disorder. Uh, depression is reduced by just a little bit of time in nature. Uh, stress levels, not only for kids but adults, are reduced. Uh, physical exercise, when done outside in nature, seems to have some kind of value added. For example, one study was done of uh, adults on treadmills, indoor gyms. And another group was spending, burning exactly the same number of calories, but doing it outdoors in a natural setting. Uh, both uh, groups got better. The people on the indoor uh, treadmills, indoor gyms, their blood pressure got better, their psychological uh, health got better. The people, though, who were doing outside hiking, gardening, some kind of green exercise, but burning exactly the same number of calories as the people on the treadmills, they did even better. We don't quite understand why that occurs, but there is something about the natural world that really uh, benefits us in ways that we don't fully understand. Um, uh, the, uh, among the other impacts is the ability to learn and be creative. Uh, studies uh, of uh, natural play spaces, these are playgrounds, uh, you know, different from the ones we're used to seeing of the flat uh, concrete or asphalt playgrounds. Studies of how kids play on those playgrounds is, is interesting, are interesting. Um, kids who play on natural play spaces compared to those who play on regular playgrounds are far more likely to invent their own games, uh, uh, to uh, invite other kids to play with them that don't necessarily look like them. They are more likely to uh, uh, play cooperatively, less likely to bully other kids. So 
uh, natural play spaces have a lot of benefits, and I think that if we really care about bullying at school, we should green all the all the school grounds, all the playgrounds. Um, uh, there are many more uh, benefits to uh, being outside in nature that are just now being measured. Child obesity, for instance, the studies of um, neighborhoods, urban neighborhoods, the urban neighborhoods that are greener. And again, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of nature, uh, but some nature in that neighborhood. The kids tend to be uh, uh, better in terms of their uh, body weight index there their uh, child obesity tends to go down in those neighborhoods, even the poorest of neighborhoods, that seems to be true. Um, uh, the next, the, uh, uh, the, the next uh, question is, 80% of Brazilians live in cities. Um, so how can we change our cities to include nature? As of 2008, more people in the world live in cities than in the countryside. That's a first in human history. Uh, at no other time in our history on, as a species have more of us lived in urban places. That's going to continue. That means one of two things. Either we will continue to lose whatever contact we have with the natural world and sense of connection, or it means the beginning of a new kind of city. Uh, a city rich in nature, uh, I like to call these nature-rich cities, ones that can become engines of biodiversity. We can do this in our cities uh, uh, through design. Uh, if we replace some of the decaying uh, suburbs, some of the decaying inner city neighborhoods, some of the decaying neighborhoods, replace them with a kind of urban uh, eco-villages that we're seeing emerge in Western Europe and in some places in Brazil and the United States. Uh, these can be neighborhoods that are denser in terms of human population, but have more nature through design, through green roofs, through uh, uh, native species in, uh, uh, in small part, uh, pockets of land, uh, through pocket parks, through wildlife corridors that go through urban places. Again, this doesn't mean necessarily fewer people. What it does mean is more specifically natural habitat, wherever we can have that. And what that means is native species. That is the basis for the food chain, which supports butterfly migration routes, bird migration routes, so we can, we can really infuse our cities with more nature. And in the act of doing that, uh, we can connect with nature. Uh, think what it would mean, what power a child would feel if they were part of creating what I've called a homegrown, a worldwide homegrown park, sometimes called a homegrown national park. But what if it was worldwide? What if we had cities creating their own uh, pieces of this all over the world? And what this would mean would be that uh, schools uh, and libraries and other institutions, national uh, natural history museums, would send kids home with, with uh, seeds and plant and, and seedlings for native plants uh, to redo their yard, to redo their schoolyard, to redo the, the, the land around their place of worship, anywhere they can do this on, on private land. At that point, if that spread, if that became contagious, you'd have uh, uh, essentially wildlife corridors going throughout our cities on private land. We can do this ourselves. We don't have to wait for government to begin the worldwide homegrown park. Um, we could have, for instance, uh, a website where once you redid your yard in native species, you could then put your pin on the map uh, on the internet and say, I did this. This is my piece of the homegrown worldwide, the worldwide homegrown park, and this is in my city. What if, in fact, cities competed to become the best city, for instance, in Brazil for children and nature? What if you had a national competition? Uh, where uh, cities decided that they were going to have five goals and meet them. Uh, you know, the number of pediatricians prescribing nature, that's happening more and more in the United States, by the way. Pediatricians are literally prescribing what I call vitamin N for nature. Uh, uh, the number of hiking trails that are added to the land in the city and around the city. Uh, the number of natural play spaces, the number of schools that are nature-based, 
set those goals and meet them in five years and then declare your own city the best city in Brazil or the best city in the United States or the best city in the world for children and nature and make it part of your marketing DNA and attract the best companies, attract the best workers. Uh, if we made this a national or worldwide competition, I think you'd begin to see interesting things happen. Um, in terms of doing that now with our uh, kids, uh, we can find nature. One of the things that the Sierra Club does in the United States is they put backpacks on kids in inner city neighborhoods and they take on them on five mile hikes in their own neighborhood and they look for nature and they find it. Uh, it's not necessarily the kind of nature you'd find in a national park, but it could be the cracks between uh, the pieces of the sidewalk where there is grass growing. It can, it can be the alleyways where there is nature. It can be in the sky where there are birds. It can be in the trees where there are there is life. And you can find it, and then you can nurture more of it. Um, so we can identify that nature which already exists around us and make better use of it. Um, the next question is, um, People are afraid of letting their children outside due to rampant crime. What can we do to have our kids spending more time outdoors without worrying about it all the time? Uh, there are several reasons for nature deficit disorder, which is, which is growing. Uh, these reasons include the amount of time the kids spend on electronics, which is extraordinary now compared to just five years ago. Even the smallest of kids now are spending more time texting and on their, on their smartphones and on computers. Another reason is bad urban design. We get lectured to all the time. Take a walk. Go outside. Walk where? In many cities in the United States, not only is there no place to walk to in terms of nature, but even if there is nature, many of our cities, our neighborhoods are controlled by private governments that restrict the amount of time uh, that people can spend. Just try to uh, put up a basketball hoop in one of these neighborhoods, let alone let the kids build a fort or a treehouse. Not going to happen because of the covenants and, and restrictions in the deed that you sign when you move into one of these neighborhoods. Uh, but one of the most important reasons that uh, kids don't go outside as much is because of fear, par parental fear. There is deep uh, concern among parents. In the Brazil, I know that, as well as in the United States, about... Uh, strangers uh, 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 and the danger that comes with strangers. Now the truth is that the number of violent crimes toward children in the United States has actually been going down for about 10 years, about 30 years actually. Uh, and what's been going up is the 24-hour news cycle, the number of stories that are repeated over and over and over, a relatively small number of stories about stranger abductions for instance when in fact the number of abductions has been going down by strangers. Uh, but because the coverage of that is round the clock and repetitive, we believe that there's far more crime out there toward children than there actually is. Now one crime is too many. I don't mean for a second to say that there is, uh, isn't risk in nature. Of course there is. Um, in fact that's one of the attractions uh, to nature is that it, it is a little risky and it's important for kids to take at least some risk, manageable risk when they're kids in order to know what to do with risk when they become teenagers. Uh, and there is danger from strangers. But there's also huge danger in spending their childhood indoors under protective house arrest. Um, a danger from child obesity. You want a real risk? That's what pediatricians say. Uh, uh, child obesity is creating diseases in children right now and in adults as they as they grow up as adults um, that are far uh, more of a risk than most of the everyday things that we worry about. Uh, pediatricians no longer see that many broken bones from kids falling out of trees when they climb them because they don't climb trees that much anymore. What pediatricians now see is carpal tunnel syndrome from too much use of, of, of computer mice from too much keyboarding. And in children, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome tends to last a lot longer than the typical broken bone. Um, so in terms of getting kids outdoors, uh, I don't expect parents to be 
to lose all their fear. They, some of that fear is quite appropriate. I felt that fear. My wife felt that fear when our kids were young. So they didn't have the kind of free-range childhood that I did growing up. But we did take them camping. We went with them. That's the first step. Take them camping. Take them fishing. Take them outdoors. Take them on a walk in an urban park. Uh, and in some ways, it, it, it's almost better if you don't know a lot about nature as an adult because you discover that nature with your child at the time. Your enthusiasm, your sense of discovery, and your sense of wonder uh, makes a huge difference. And that's what kids pick up on. It's not so much what you know in terms of the information. is it how you feel when you're experiencing nature. And your kids will learn from that. Um, one woman told me that she wants to be or tries to be a hummingbird parent. What she means by that is not a, a we call them helicopter parents, parents who hover over their kids all the time and worry about them and don't let them, uh, you know, do anything that might be risky at all. She doesn't want to be a helicopter parent. She wants to be a hummingbird parent. A hummingbird parent, by her definition, is a parent who hangs back, who watches, she watches her children from the kitchen window and they're out in the yard or at the edge of the trees to make sure they're safe. Or when she's at the park, she hangs back at a distance. She doesn't tell them everything to do. She hangs back and lets them dig a hole, lets them explore the plants and, and maybe climb a tree, all of this. And she swoops in only when they're in mortal danger. Uh, that to her is being a hummingbird parent, and that's a lot better than being the kind of parent that doesn't let their kid have any freedom. Kids need that freedom in order to learn to deal with risk and to learn to control themselves, to learn to make their own decisions.